Okay, so I will start the online short course. Okay, do I start to share screen now? Uh, no, after the, we have a queue that you have, you gonna present. Okay. okay. Yeah, we give you the queue. Okay. We we'll let you know when yeah. the time is coming for you to present. <laughs> Oke, okay, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning and welcome to the online seminar of Faculty of Public Health Series 20. This event is an online short course under the Global Academic Program. And today we will discuss about implementing safety too in the field. Today's event, Wednesday, uh, we will. This event is organized by Occupational Safety and Health Master Study Program, Faculty of Public Health, Universitas Indonesia, and also supported by Universitas Indonesia Alumni Association and also WHS Student Association of Faculty of Public Health, Universitas Indonesia. So I would like to welcome to our speaker, Mr. Hossam Abul Saad from the University of Queensland, Australia, and also Ibu Indri Hapsari Susilawati. PhD as the head of OHS department. And also I would like to welcome Bapak Dr. Zulkifli Junaidi as the head of OHS master's study program of Faculty of Public Health Universitas Indonesia. And also our moderator, please welcome Mr. Mufti Wirawan and all lecturers from the OHS department. And I would like to also welcome to all participants, our OHS fellow students, alumni, alumni and as well as practitioner from various industry who have attended this event. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Miranda Suryawardani, and I will get through this event as the master of ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, I would like to explain the schedule of today's event. The event will be opened by the head of OHS department, and then we start the presentation from the speaker and also the Q&A discussion session. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to expect you to pay attention to these following matters. First, please turn off your microphone as well as your video because you are not allowed to screen share during the event. And if you have any question, please write it down through the Q&A section with the format name of the participant and also the question. And it is expected that all participants to fill in the attendance list on the link that will be sent via the chat column. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, according to the Occupational Health and Safety Requirements at Universitas Indonesia, we are from OHS Department Faculty of Public Health, will deliver a safety induction first. This event has been conducted through Zoom application where all participants join in the home and workspace each. So we would like to ask all of you to keep pay attention on the visibility of your PC, laptop, or your mobile devices. And also, please, we hope all participants to keep attention to the ergonomic aspect. Make, please make sure your sitting position are safe during the session. Keep attention to the electrical hazards such as cable charger or switch around you. And also, if you attend this seminar together, don't forget to keep your physical distancing. Please stay healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic and practice 5M wearing masks, hand washing, physical distancing, avoiding crowded and limit your mobilization. And before we start, let's ask, uh, set a prayer to God Almighty. Uh, start praying. Praise over. And next, I would like to invite Bu Indri Hap Sari Susilawati, PhD, as the head of the OHS department to deliver the opening speech. Please, Bu Indri. Thank you, Ms. Miranda. Can uh, my voice is uh, clearly? Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Dean of Faculty of Public Health, Head of Master of Occupational Health and Safety Study Program, Lecturer of Occupational Health and Safety, Faculty Member of Faculty of Public Health, and a student in alumni. I highly appreciate Mr. Sam. Mr. 
bisa Ini suaranya nggak jelas ya? Okay, I think Bu Indri is now, uh, yeah, because of the connection problem, I think. So maybe we just continue to get through the events. I'm so, I'm so sorry that, I apologize that maybe this is the connection problem. So maybe next uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Zulkifli. Sorry. Oh, Bu Indri is now back again. Ah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, my internet is unstable, so I yeah. have to leave. Yeah. yeah. Now I, I I change with my mobile phone, so I think oh, yeah. mobile phone is better. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Bu please continue. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I will continue. Thank you so much for the great effort for all team, particularly for the head of master program Dr. Suki Free and the secretary of master program Dr. Dadan Erwandi and of course thankful also for Mr. Mufti Wirawan uh, as the moderator for this session and thank you for all our lecturer, student, alumni, researchers and practitioner from various industry who have attended this event. Hopefully we will gain the new insight knowledge and can be applied in our respective workplace, especially about safety too. This will be a good input for our student and alumni who will be important role in the OHS, uh, OSS field. And for your information, this online short course is under the Global Academic Program which conducted and supported fund to achieve the international accreditation and to improve the academic reputation under visiting professor scheme. Therefore, it is expected that our collaboration with the University of Queensland do not stop after this event. Hopefully, we can continue work together in improving OSS knowledge, especially in the... Uh, safety scope area in the OSS. Okay, I believe all of us were looking forward for other activity in the near future with the interesting and update the data, uh, update the, tap, the topic of the seminar. Well, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the lecture and thank you for your particip participation and enthusiasm for this seminar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Bu Indri. And then I would like to ask uh, Bapak Dr. Zulkifi Junaidi as the head of the OHS Master Study Program to deliver the Certificate of Appreciation to our speaker, Hossam Abdul Saad uh, from the University of Queensland. Thank you very much. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum salam. Um, Hossam, uh, we are very happy today yeah, uh, to have you in this event. And uh, representing the Faculty of Public Health, I would like to give you a certificate of appreciation. You know, the certificate is proudly presented to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Shukran, Shukran. Shukran. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Bapak Dr. Zulkifli. Now we're going to start the presentation by the speaker who will be guided by the moderator, Mr. Mufti Wirawan. Uh, he is a lecturer and also a doctoral candidate in Occupational Health and Safety Department Faculty of Public Health Universitas Indonesia. So, Mr. Mufti, please, the time is yours. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mirinda Surya Wardani, for the time. And uh, good morning to ladies and gentlemen, uh, especially uh, for our uh, magister students, magister of occupational health and safety program, uh, and also the bachelor students from the bachelor program and the alumni of uh, occupational health and safety department program. Uh, today, uh, I'm very uh, grateful to be your moderator to guide you all to our uh, session uh, below of the program of the academic global program about uh, international guest lecture, uh, which is uh, we had a topic today is safety two uh, in. Uh, implementing uh, in the field yeah uh, now we have our uh, respect, respectful uh, lecture uh, which is i believe he is uh, very uh, competent to uh, deliver the uh, material about uh, safety too because this is the topic of his uh, phd okay uh miss miranda maybe we have a short profile of yeah mr hossam this is uh, a short profile of our like lecturer or maybe speaker today uh, he is uh, have uh, experience yeah in a uh, field and uh, managerial uh, yeah I, I think in the practical area of the occupational health and safety more than uh, 10 years and uh, he also have a uh, degree in uh, civil engineering and uh, master degree in occupational health and safety and uh, currently a phd student in occupational health and safety in the university of queensland so uh, both in the practical and academic area uh, mr hossam has a lot of experience okay uh, Okay, maybe I will explain about the uh, our schedule today. Yeah, uh, we will have a presentation from Mr. Sam uh, around uh, 60 minutes, and then we move to the uh, question and answer session. As uh, Miss Miranda mentioned before, that uh, all attendees or a participation of this uh, session uh, we would like to please you to write your question and answer in the q a uh, column uh, we will uh, select the question uh, to be answered by our uh, guest lectures today uh, we will divide the question uh, session into uh, two uh, Two sessions. Uh, for the first session, we will uh, select maybe three persons or three participants to have or uh, ask the questions directly by uh, open your mic and video. You can ask directly to our uh, lecture today, um, and. Uh, we will limit the question for each participant only one questions yeah so we will have three persons and three questions in the first question session and after that we will move again to the second uh, questions like the first session if we still have time maybe we will continue to the uh, third session that uh, we will look for uh, the time um, maybe that's my explanation for our uh, schedule 
uh, during uh, this program and the online short course uh, global academic program okay and uh, for all the participation um, please uh, mute your um, mic during the presentation and then uh, be prepared for uh, your question and also uh, prepare for uh, selected uh, participation participant to, uh, to have uh, opportunity to deliver the question directly okay uh, now we will move to the uh, next schedule which is uh, the presentation uh, session by our speaker or our guest lectures today so uh, please to have your time mr osam uh, 60 minutes to present your uh, topic or material uh, today thank you very much okay so now Sorry about that. Okay, it's okay. Take your time. Yeah. The messages coming out of the. Yeah. Bismillah rahman rahim. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, today we're talking about. Uh, today we're talking about safety too, and uh, talk about the theory itself, the principles that the theory argues, uh, and also uh, we will talk about. Uh, we'll give some, we'll have some insights into the, sorry, yeah. yeah, today this is the outline, we're talking about what safety differently is, how it developed and uh, what are the main principles uh, of it, and also we'll talk about safety differently in practice, we will try to, I will try to uh, share with you some features and challenges from insights uh, of the PhD research that I'm doing. So uh, as I said, I, 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 the plan was to, uh, to show you a video, like an introduction about safety differently. I would prefer to leave this uh, like maybe at the end of the session so that I uh, be able to deliver the whole uh, content of the, of the presentation. Now, uh, first of all, uh, Safety2 is, has, you know, this, the authors and the founders of Safety2 argued that the current uh, safety management model or approach is problematic. It has provided us with a lot of uh, improvement and a lot of you know benefits in the safety domain. Has, it has improved the uh, reduction of risks in many aspects, but it still have its own weaknesses and problems. And we actually have reached to a stable point. We are not able anymore to uh, improve safety more than what we have been uh, put like in terms of improvement over the last 20 or 30 years. So safety too as a movement is um, is criticizing the traditional model of safety that the current approach of safety uh, management and also is uh, introducing a different approach to manage safety. So how organizations run safety today? There are three main uh, factors or three main uh, ideas that actually the, the current safety management approach is revolving around. First one is the fact that workers are uh, workers are the problem. Workers are workers' behavior is the reason for accidents, and specifically, a workers' attempts to deviate or to be different or to behave differently from the plan or the design put by the management is uh, is the reason why accident happens. Um, so, 
people behavior, workers behavior are seen, is seen as the weakest point in the accident chain. So this is the main tenet or the main um, you know, idea of that really uh, guides uh, our understanding of safety management nowadays. The other, uh, the other idea also that, uh, that also characterized today's model of uh, health and safety management is the fact that because the people's behavior are the problem, management's objective is to try to control the behavior. They're trying to making the behavior in compliance with the management design and the management plan. This is the main objectives of the management of the safety management to, to ensure that the, safe, the behavior of the workers is consistent with what the management wants, with what the management's uh, procedures and plans. And based on that, the criteria for success is the number of accidents. So uh, if you want to assess how, uh, how serious or how you know, effective we are in, in managing safety, we look at the lagging indicators, uh, the, 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 the number of accidents, the lost time and stuff like that. So these are the main three uh, you know, ideas that uh, our management system today are revolving around. People are the problem, their behavior is the reason for accidents. Management's role is to ensure or try to control the behavior to make sure that this behavior is inconsistent with the management design and the plan, and then putting uh, the lagging indicators as, um, as a, a criteria for success. So what's wrong with this? What's wrong with these three ideas? Uh, what has these three ideas uh, took us to? The first thing is we added to safety bureaucracy. Uh, the process itself, the system itself become the goal, not the reduction of the risk. We uh, created something called cluttering. Cluttering is the accumulation of safety practices that really do not contribute to the reduction of risk. We have a lot of safety activities going around, but very little of them really contributes or adds value to the risk reduction. So, um, so this is one of the fruits of the current model. It, in, it increased the safety bureaucracy, it increased cluttering. We have now more and more activities of safety, but uh, very few of them actually help reduce the risks. The other thing that uh, the current model has really uh, is responsible for is creating also a gap between work as done and work as imagined. I'm not sure if you've heard this, um, this uh, uh, statement before. Um, the, 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 the current model has made a rift between the management and the workforce. Uh, so what the management are designing and planning is totally disconnected from what the people actually do, actually do at the ground, at the job site. And this gap, along with the cluttering, both of them has really led to a, a wide range of problematic uh, issues in safety. One of them is losing sight of real risks, opportunity. We are now focusing more on appearance, focusing more in showing good numbers. Uh, we are focusing more in showing the government that we are in compliance. Um, and then there's, uh, because of this accumulation of safety activities, we feel that because if we have many activities around that we have safety, so it gives you a full sense of safety. And because of this, you know, unnecessary safety activities, we are actually wasting money and uh, uh, it's costing us money. Uh, so, the problem that, but actually I think one of the biggest problems of this approach is that there is no effect, effective learning and the management because of the, this, the disconnection between the management and the workforce, we are not learning as managers. We, are not, we don't know exactly what's happening on the ground and we are preventing ourselves from learning from uh, of the actual work. We are like listening to ourselves as a management. We are putting the plan and we, I think the plan is done and we take our decision according to that while this is not really the case. So it, we are preventing ourselves from effective learning. We are creating a workforce that is disengaged. They, are, they do not feel ownership. They do not feel that they are belong to the company. They do not feel that they need really to be interested in um, you know, uh, getting in feedback or giving feedback to the leadership about what happens on the ground because of this disconnection between what the management does and, and designs and plans and what the workers actually do. And this really also leads us to the uh, this tension between safety and operation. Um, the management puts imaginary uh, objectives of safety, but the operation people on the ground find it difficult to implement these requirements. So we always find the safety man running after the operation, trying to enforce force them to implement these unrealistic 
uh, you know, unrealistic uh, instructions, or unrealistic rules. So we will we continue to have this tension between safety and operation because of this gap between work as done and work as imagined. And also safety is not improving. As I said, this is one of the main arguments of the safety to authors. We are not seeing any, you know, significant improvement in safety so far. Uh, we, the, the, and the worst part, in my opinion, is the profession, the undermine, the profession is getting undermined. People are looking at the profession as like, we are doing policing, we are police doing, trying to enforce uh, rules and instructions and not engaged in dialogue and understanding of the work. So these are a, a bunch of really negative uh, consequences of the current approach according to the safety two theories and, and uh, based on these you know, consequences, they are arguing that their approach is really uh, promising and is going to treat or uh, deal with all these problems. So just to clarify, so the two problems is clustering, bureaucracy, and work has done and work has imagined gap. Now, safety two stands on uh, the same Safety two theory or ideas. Actually, safety two is not a specific theory. It's a group of ideas about work and about people. And the safety two ideas can be summarized under three main principles. Uh, first principle is this recognizing the gap between work as done and work as imagined. Um, uh, um, you know, trying to trying to bridge the, the gap between what the people do on the ground and what the, the management really designs and plans for the work. So this is the first pillar. The second pillar is because of this gap between work as done and work as imagined, there is a need for us as management to go and study the normal work. We have to go to the site and study actual work, how people do the work, how people deal with variabilities of the work and how do they adapt with that. And then after that, the third pillar is that we need to make sure that the adaptations of the workers are recognized. When, when a worker or when a group of work decides to deviate from the plan or from the design, we need as management to acknowledge that. We need to look at that as an opportunity, not as a threat to uh, safety. We need to look at it and see if we can really implement it, if it's, uh, I mean, in terms of risk. And uh, this is all uh, for the purpose of giving workers more authority. So one of the main promises, or one of the main norm normative requirement of the safety tool is to give workers more authority for decision making. They are, uh, they are not anymore only as receivers or receptors. We want to give them more authority to be part of the decision making process. So these are the main pillars of safety tool. Recognize the gap work is done, work is imagined, studying the work as it's done, and make sure that workers are part of the decision making in a, a genuinely, genuine, not only like superficially, but really a part of the decision making. So these three pillars actually tell us that safety too is, is, has come to challenge our conceptions about work and about people. So these, these three pillars really reflect a new redefinition of our, our perception about the role of workers the authority of workers, to what extent workers can really interfere in the plan and the design of work. So the safety tool comes to challenge that, the old and traditional concepts, uh, the, the concept that management is only the responsible for the, for the design and the establishment of procedures. The safety tool comes to say, look, we need to look at giving workers authority to also be able to give, uh, to have the power to uh, also establish procedures and influence the procedures. The same also with work. We, uh, the, the, our safety tool is calling us to change our perspective about work. Uh, actual work, um, actual work is really what matters to safety, not the procedures and not the plans. So for work, actual work is what matters for safety. Uh, safety tool asks us that, uh, uh, directs our attention to the fact that work, when we refer to work, we refer to work as an actual work, not the plan or the procedure. And it also, um, uh, it also calls for looking at work variabilities. I mean, uh, working off the plan or working, um, you know, without, you know, without, you know, without workers, you know, violating the plans or working uh, not really in consistent with the plan. We should look at that positively, not negatively. So work variabilities are inevitable and even desirable. So we cannot hide the fact that work in the in the workplace does not really run as we imagine in the office. Uh, and also work is unsafe when only ad adaptations to variabilities is prevented or done 
negatively or done improperly. So we want, we don't want to prevent people adapting their behavior. We don't want to prevent people innovating and coming up with new ways to do things, even though this new way of doing things is not really consistent with our plan and design. We should welcome that. And then safety work is about facilitating appropriate safe adaptations, as I said. And then lack of ineffective information about aggression is what hinders management decision. This is also important. Now, the management, the problem of management, uh, you know, uh, giving ineffective decisions or um, you know, decision that does not help safety is caused by the fact that we are not getting enough information about what's happening on the ground. And then work should be studied on the site. We should go and observe work ourselves and start to work from there and depart from there. This is, this is relating to work and our uh, re, uh, redefinition of our conception of work. There is also our reconception or redefinition of or our different view of workers according to safety too. According to safety too, workers should be trusted. As I said before, they need to be get, they need to get more authority to be part of the decision decision making. So workers, the work expert, they should share authority to put rules. Uh, their behavior reflect attempts or adaptations. We need to look positively at their deviations, at their mistakes or errors. Um, and then we want to make sure that the hierarchy of the management, the hierarchy of the organization does not really uh, make a rift or a, dis uh, a disconnection between the management and the workforce. So we want to restructure our organization, maybe flatten the structures a little bit to be able to reduce this hierarchy. And also safety officers in the safety to uh, domain have, plays a really uh, important role in making the bridge or the link between the management and the workforce. Because what the safety officer do under the safety to uh, safety to um, approach is that he observes work, he sees the adaptations of the workers, and he co he contacts with the management to start to um, put the different different perspective close together. So uh, the safety officers here are the one who uh, connects the the workers with the management. So just to give you a, a hint or some uh, I, I like some idea about how important how central the idea of uh, workers' authority and the safety tool. These citations are from uh, uh, two of the founders of safety tool, Sidney Dicker and Hollingill. So for Dicker, for example, he clearly believes that errors even in the sharp end is uh, grounded to the system failures. Uh, he says people are not the, in the, in the instigators of failure. They are the, recipient, the recipients of it. They are the inheritors. So he believes that the errors are caused by the system failure systems and the people who put the system, meaning the management and the leadership, who are, they are the ones to be blamed if there is an error on the sharp end. So this is, and it gives you how central this idea of people are the solution in the literature of safety too, and in the mind of the authors and the scholars of the safety too. The other citation here by uh, Eric Holnigel is that uh, people are able to recognize actual demands. They can adjust, uh, people can detect and correct when something goes wrong. We can see here uh, an absolute faith and confidence in the workers' capacity in doing things and correcting things. So yeah, the, I, I just brought this, these two examples to give you some idea about how central the idea of workers not to be blamed in the literature of safety too. Workers, I don't want to say it, but in safety too, workers should be looked at, uh, at the experts. Uh, their views should be uh, superior to the plan or the design, uh, we change the plan, not change the behavior of the workers. So the, the, if, if the workers chose to do a job in a certain way, and this way is proved to be safe, we need to change our plan accordingly and not the vice, not the, not the other way around. Uh, now, another also citation from, uh, from Sidney Dicker about the procedure error. He says that error is only error in the eyes of the management. It is the management who calls error an error. It's actually not an error until the management, because the management wants it to be an error, it is an error. But actually, uh, most of these errors are not really errors of the workers. They are um, you know, attempts from the workers to adapt with the work variabilities and the work conditions. So this is exactly how do they see uh, the procedural error as a social construct. So uh, we are not, as I mean, a worker, we are not entitled uh, with uh, the management's definition of errors. We need to look at errors differently. Errors are just error because we think it differs from the plan. 
but if we look at it on the on the actual on the ground, it might really give sense or make sense. So, what are the mechanisms and promises of safety tool in general? Well, safety tool theory sees the uh, mechanisms to do better safety first. As we said, we will not oppose or suppress workers' deviations from plans. This is golden rule. We will actually acknowledge their adaptation, their choices. Instead of preventing them, enforcing them to go hide or done underground, you know, you know, shortcuts, instead of preventing them uh, doing their adaptation and their choices, because we don't want them to run underground with their activities. We don't want to, we don't want them to do it like in the secretly or hiding. So let's uh, encourage them to tell us about this adaptation. Let, let us encourage them to tell us about their new methods of doing the job. Let's study this adaptive practice together, the management and the workers. Let's see what are the risks and let's see what as a management we can do to help, uh, to help the workers do the work, like in terms of enhancing the skills of the worker to be able to adapt, which is resilience. So what we are asking, what the mechanism that safety tool is suggesting is one, we, we, we do something called guided adaptability. So we accept the variations, we accept the deviation from the standard, but we as a management should be able to have like an input in that. We should be able to control it in some way, like to guide it, to organize it, to, uh, to, um, to make sure that it's not, uh, it's not risky, but we shouldn't really prevent it from the first sight. We need to look at it and see if we can really adapt it, uh, if we can really implement it. And also the other thing is to enhance the workers' skills to be able to adapt to uh, contingencies and to problems. So yeah, this is the promises of, uh, of safety too. They promise that safety efficiency reconciliation will happen. And actually this is very logic. If we are, going, if we are not going to prevent workers from you know, doing uh, or coming with innovative ideas about the way they want to do work, the work, even though if it might be you know, different from the plan. This will help us really uh, reconcile between safety and efficiency. Uh, we don't want to have distinction anymore between the operation and uh, uh, between the operation and the safety people. If the operation people think that the safety rule is ridiculous, doesn't make any sense. We, we are open to discuss that, it's not, it's not a big deal. So this really eased the tension and adds to the reconciliation between safety and efficiency. We are also improving uh, safety itself. We are focusing now on real risks. We are not now chasing people to comply with ridiculous rules and uh, we are not running after them to do paperwork that does not really add value to the, to the risk. We are actually now talking about real risks, how the workers see the risk and how they are assessing that risk. We are also empowering workers to come back to us and feed us with information about what happens on the site. One of the main arguments of the safety tool is that accident happens because our management does not, does not give proper decisions because they do not have good information about what happens on the ground. So if we able to encourage workers to come to us and voluntarily and say, look, this is the way I, this is your plan. I don't think it's gonna work. This is the way I want to do the work. And if we, if we acknowledge that, then we will help encourage this kind of attitude and practice. And then we will enhance also operational, operational efficiency. And frankly speaking, based on my experience with the organization, that, the organization that I'm working with now in the research, this is specifically is one of the most selling points of safety two. Uh, safety two, the safety two authors are promising organization that if they implement safety too, they will be able to enhance efficiency, operational efficiency, let alone safety. So they will, because we are going to remove paperwork, we're going to remove any activities that does not, does not help uh, reducing the risk. So we are actually removing wastes. We are getting rid of any excessive work that does not important. We are also, when we give workers autonomy and ability to do the things that they think is okay, then we are actually enhancing their job satisfaction. And we are motivating them to do more effort and be more loyal to the company and um, you know, uh, to be interested on, in you know, going the extra mile. And uh, we are actually, within the safety tool, we are helping workers to enhance their skills to be able to um, you know, face contingencies and problems. So these are the three main uh, promises of safety tool. How, how we are going to do that? Safety too, as I said, is very important in this process. 
And we are going, as I said before, and I will keep saying this to the end of this lecture, we need to go and observe how the workers work without interference. We want to look at what they do and acknowledge what they do. And this is what's called reality-based research. We go and observe what they do. And then from there, we understand what kind of adaptations they do, what they need from us as management. Now, what are the origins and development that Safety2 has witnessed? Safety2 as a movement uh, started in Australia by Sydney Dicker, Professor Sydney Dicker in Griffith University, uh, with collaboration with a number of scholars from Denmark, like Eric Holnigel, and also other uh, scholars from the US. Uh, the very first talks about Safety2 took place in, tw uh, in 2012, uh, and Sydney Rich, it started with Sydney Dicker trying to reach out to big companies in, in Australia. Uh, he started to offer the, uh, the, uh, the theory and he started to offer them some kind of collaboration like industry research collaboration. Uh, and some of these companies actually uh, welcome that. Uh, he, he was, he's, a very, he's a very good negotiator, by the way. I think, I'm not sure if you have heard him speaking. He's a very impressive speaker. So uh, he was able actually to convince some of the big, big companies uh, in Australia to start to uh, at least make experiments on safety too. Um, but what I really want to deliver from this slide, specific slide, is that the development of safety too in, and the spread of the ideas of safety too in the field uh, can really help us understand how any safety idea can really spread in the industry. We want to know how how we end up doing toolbox talks. Where did it start? Where, where, where did this start? How, how it started? And how it really spread to be a prominent practice in the field? How pre-task safety assessment started and how it developed and spread over the industry, not only in one country, but all over the world. So, you know, looking at the development of safety tool, and we are lucky now, we are witnessing the birth of this movement and the development the, and the growth, or the upbringing of this, we will be able to understand how safety ideas really grow and spread and trans transfer from place to another. And I can tell you that uh, the role of consultants and professional networking is very important. I have, as I said, I am working with, uh, I'm, I'm collecting information data from one of the companies that actually implement, trying to implement safety too. They have like every month, there is some kind of professional network event, a conference, a forum about safety too, organized by Griffith University by the movement, the safety tool movement. They, every time, every time and on, they are inviting the, the, the industry like organizations to come and talk about safety tool. And this really helped a lot in spreading the world about the word about safety tool. And it can give some, you know, um, tips to anyone who wants to spread some idea about safety, to, uh, about safety in general. So as I said, uh, the adoption, what we can take out of this is that the, 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 the you know, Sidney Dicker was really uh, smart. He went to the big companies. What happens when a big company adopts uh, an activity, a uh, Mufti? When a big company adopts an activity, the subcontractors will adopt the same activity. So big companies really is a good, uh, is a good participant for any experiment. And he was really smart in choosing big companies to start with. And because, you know, big companies actually employ a, a huge number of subcontractors. And it's, it goes by naturally that when a principal contractor have a system, all the subcontractors would want to follow and comply with that system. So it was really a wise move from him to start with big companies to adopt this uh, idea. It's also the, this, the Griffiths focus on networking and socialization in the industry level. This also, also helped a lot in spreading the word about safety too and give safety too legitimacy. And this is important. Why a company, in, in order for any idea to be adopted, we need to make sure that it's legitimate idea, it's a credible one. And how we can give any idea credibility if adopters, if the adopters are legitimate. So big companies are very legitimate and credible, you know, uh, adopters. And also if the professional in the industry keeps talking about the safety too, it means that it, it gives, it adds a legitimacy to the idea. And this is really what happens to safety too. And, and this is what is, is what's, what still continues to happen also as I said, these conferences is, is continues to happen all the time. So what are the selling points uh, that the safety two authors and safety two movement is trying to, uh, to give or to promote? One is capitalize on the traditional safety frustrations. They, 
the first thing, if you talk to uh, Sydney Dicker or if you go to any conferences of these conferences, the first thing they will start talking about the, the weaknesses of safety one, the weaknesses of the traditional model. So they start criticizing, there's a lot of criticism of safety one and the traditional model in the safety two arguments. So they build a lot on the weaknesses of safety one in, in order to sell the safety two. Another thing also, as I said, they have a very logic and arguments. They come, they say, to, they say to you, why do we need to continue doing safety activities that does not add any value to the risk? And this is a very logic argument. So this, you know, the, why we are looking at workers like receivers. They are experts in the field. They can help us really design the work. So they bring in a couple of very logical arguments that are really attractive uh, to the audience. So these two ceiling points are really what the safety two is uh, safety two authors are playing with. So now I would like to give some uh, insights. Uh, before I go, let's uh, I will try to uh, I will try to put the video so that we get a little a breather for the for the audience. Uh, so I have to go. I will stop. Sorry, I will stop. Yes, I'm just to remind you, you have uh, you have 31 minutes. Okay. I'm not sure if uh, okay. let's. Okay. Let Let me continue, and then if if there's time, I will I will put the video at, at the end. Okay, yeah. okay, now I will discuss with you some of the insights from a case study. As I said, I, uh, I have been really, alhamdulillah, you know, fortunate, lucky to land on an, a company, a company that uh, is implementing safety too. And uh, in the beginning, I wasn't really looking at safety too. I was looking at management practices and how they affect safety in general. But uh, when this company, you know, uh, you know uh, allowed us to go in and, and collect data, I was surprised that they are considering and they are in the very first steps of implementing safety tools. So for me, that was really a fortunate, uh, fortunate thing, alhamdulillah. So, and, and actually this company is one of the very few companies in Australia that implementing safety tools. Although despite all the momentum of the safety tool now is gaining, the, the companies, the organizations that actually are implementing safety tools are very, very few. And this company uh, is one of these few companies. And I will let you know why it's still a little bit slow in terms of implementation across the industry. So as I said, this is an ethnography. I was looking at safety to adoption and implementation experience in a, an infrastructure company. I have been with this company now for two years of, of continuous observation and interaction with the management, specifically the management. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, yeah the, the, there's a fees a little bit. Okay. So I'm doing an ethnography based inquiry into the management practices. And uh, this was the main scope. That, that was the initial, this is what the initial scope of my study, very broad scope. And then, uh, you know, this is the, the nice thing about qualitative research and ethnography. You start with a very broad question, very broad objective, and then you narrow that down until you reach a very specific question or specific you know objective and this is what happened with me i start with a very broad one and then as as the observation goes on at the dynamics on the ground uh, really progresses now this scope has re has refined to this why and how the firm is adopting and implementing the safety tool uh, so this became my thesis question okay so ethnography is observing ethnography organization ethnography is simply observing people at work you go and see what people do, uh, record that, and study that later on. Uh, I started with uh, a personal shadowing. Shadowing is accompanying a person, like a, his shadow. You go, you accompany him, you join him wherever he goes. So if he goes to the office, you are with him. If he goes to the meeting, you are with him. If he goes to the site, you will follow him. So you're following a specific person whenever he goes. So that was the main method that I had at the beginning, like in the plan. I, I will follow the managers uh, wherever they go, try to see how they interact, how do they go to the, with the day-to-day -day activities and how do they go with the interactions. 
uh, the interaction with the people inside the organization and people outside the organization. And uh, also semi structured interviews were actually the secondary method. So the main method was observing them and the, the, the secondary method was, uh, was interviews. Now, after, after some time, and this is again, one of the beauties of ethnographies, after some time in the, in the observation, I found that uh, you know, following a person is not really, doesn't really make sense. Most of the managers are fixed in front of their computers for prolonged hours. So if I want to follow him, it means I have to sit in his office looking at him while he is working on his emails for hours. So it doesn't really help gathering any kind of data. So after some time, I found that following the, the managers in the meetings is really a good source of good data. Rather than sitting with him idly without doing anything in his office, looking at him, uh, working in his computer, I just join him in any meetings he has, whether this is meeting a scheduled meeting or non-scheduled meeting. And I can tell you managers do a lot of meetings. You will not have time. There is a lot and a lot of meetings happening in any organization, especially involving the management. So yeah, it was a source of a very rich and, and, uh, and uh, a heap amount of data. Uh, so yeah, exactly. This is, uh, this is exactly how the, the, the ethnography started and how it really refined in terms of the objective and in terms of the method itself. So now, as I said, my first impression about my first expectation about the ethnography, I expected the manager will be dealing most of the time with people within the group, within the, within the, uh, within the organization. I found that uh, a lot of the manager's interactions happens actually with stakeholders from outside the organization, dealing with clients, suppliers, subcontractors, the parent companies and stuff like that. So yeah, there is a huge amount of interactions between the managers, especially the contract managers and the senior management with the uh, external stakeholders, okay? Okay, I, as I said, at the beginning under the banner of safety differently, the name differently, I was expecting to see different practice. I was ex expecting to see very new and novel practices that I have never seen before on any site. And actually I, I turned out to be wrong. Uh, I didn't find, I didn't see any new or novel process or any novel practice in safety. I saw the same safety practices or many of them, but with different mentality, with different approach, different setting, different objective, different outcome in mind. This is what I saw. I, I didn't see anything novel in terms of safety to uh, practices. So for example, uh, communication and consultation, we all do this. Every company tried to do communication and consultation with workers. What, the, what we do usually, any company go and meet with the workers, like planning meetings or any learning, you know, meetings, toolbox meetings, whatever, different meetings that we involve workers with. So I saw that, I saw people, uh, managers and workforce meetings, but you know, in the, in, the, in the traditional system, we only meet because of a problem. We only meet with workers when there is an accident, when there is something wrong, we want to discuss it with the worker, when there is some kind of instructions we want to give to the workers. So this is uh, how meeting with workers really is triggered. Um, we, the the main objective of meeting with workers to make sure that the workers know what we want and uh, to comply with the procedures. Now, what I found in the company that they have the same meeting, but they have different objectives. They want, they are seeking feedback. They're stressing the workers to come up with, with their own ideas and their own perspectives. They are revising the plan in the meeting in front of the workers. So they have the plan and then workers uh, give their own ideas and then the facilitator changes the plan at spot and in front of them if, if, it's, if it's possible to do so. If it's something needs further study, the, he will promise them to, to go on, make study it further. So this is a difference. Same meeting, the same practice, but different objectives and different setting. The same also is monitoring and controlling. Any company want to monitor workers and make sure that there's a control going around, supervision and stuff like that. So we send safety officers to look off the work. I saw the same, I saw safety workers uh, you know, touring the sites, monitoring works. But what was different? Uh, so this is the old system. We go around, we send our safety officers to capture violations. We send them to rectify and to enforce the plan. Now, what I saw the safety workers or the safety officers doing in this company, I saw them capturing adaptations. They look at these violations at adaptation. They never stop the workers do whatever they want to do unless it's really an immediate risk. And unless it's really very like reckless behavior. 
if it's not like that, they just keep the workers do whatever they want without interference. So the, the safety officers look at these violations, not the violations, look at these deviations from the plan as adaptations. Uh, the safety officers document that adaptations or variations and discuss it with the safety manager. And then the safety manager will later on send for the workers uh, to the group of the workers to discuss this new adaptations, try to recognize them and acknowledge them. So this is two examples of exactly uh, the idea that I want to deliver is that there's no new or novel practice. It's just the same practices with different mentality and different approach and different objectives. So some of the examples uh, in the company that I saw, they remove site safety papers, some of the site safety papers. They, they actually try to remove, they remove take five, but they still struggling with removing pre-start job safety analysis. And I will tell you why they are still struggling with that. But they, they were able actually to remove take five. They are studying normal work. As I said, they are sending, they, are, they have appointed a couple of uh, safety uh, officers to go around, uh, uh, document what the work workers do. And then uh, this, the description of the work has been later on analyzed uh, to see what, what are the adaptation, what are the variabilities of the work. And then if there's any chance one of these adaptations can really be recognized, then the company would recognize them. And they have already recognized a number of uh, workers' adapt adaptive behaviors. So uh, the, when the safety people went out, there were a couple of practices that were not according to the procedure. The company did not prevent them. They did not stop them. They actually adopted them. Uh, one of them was using some kind of lifting tool that is not a standard lifting tool. The company did some tests on that tool and the tests found okay. So they said, okay, you can keep going with this stand with this tool, although it is not a standard tool in the industry. So this one, it was one example of, uh, of recognizing the adaptive work and the behavior of the workers. Uh, the, the company also introduced a new policy. They call it the amnesty policy. In this policy, there's no discipline. If you come up as a worker with uh, um, reporting a violation or a deviation from the procedure, if you, we will never discipline you. And this happened, people went in a confined space, they didn't do a permit, they had their own reasons, they justified the reasons and they were accepted and their uh, practice were, uh, was recognized actually. And so this one was one of the very significant changes in the management attitude. They stopped you know, uh, disciplining people on deviations as long as this deviation has been reported voluntarily. Uh, and okay, this is also important. As I said, they continue doing consultation and stuff like that. So these are some of the examples of safety tool uh, practices. Now, one of the uh, one of the main uh, one of the main uh, a key question of my research was about why the organization is adopting safety tool. Why that? Why did that organization or the management of the organization saw a chance or opportunity in safety tool? What makes them really attractive in their eyes? So. One of the things that I was looking at as an ethnographer is to understand why did they take the decision to adopt safety tool? And more importantly, to understand what are the assumptions, the beliefs that underlies this decision. And more importantly as well is to try to capture uh, the sources of these beliefs. You know, uh, if they decided to, 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 to adopt safety tool, what kind of assumptions they have in mind or perceptions they have in mind about safety too. And what are these perceptions come from? Where they come from? Uh, so that was the main objective of my study, studying what the underlying assumption and studying the sources of this assumption, where they come from. And I found that many of these assumptions and beliefs are really grounded to the environment, to the institutional environment outside the organization. I found that most of the values and beliefs that encourage the management to adopt safety too comes from the professional uh, community comes from the regulatory environment, comes from the uh, society culture itself uh, that penetrates inside the organization. So, uh, so factors that is, now we will look at what are the factors that really facilitated the adoption of safety tool? What are those logics and beliefs that help the management to see a good opportunity in adopting safety tool? First thing is the institutionalized norms and beliefs. Some of the, I found that the leaders of the company hold personal beliefs about progressiveness, being progressive. Uh, I mean, progressive means, you know, being innovative, trying new things. Um, 
uh, will come, you know, bashing the old and the tradition and trying new things. And this is really go in line with uh, the liberal ideas about modernity and post-modernity and about, you know, getting rid of the traditional and, and challenging the, the, old, uh, the old habits. So I found that the, the leaders themselves hold this progressive thinking and uh, safety too with, uh, with the argument of, you know, challenging per per perceptions about work and about people, they are, it's actually a progressive, uh, progressive theory. So safety too is a progressive theory and it agreed with the personal beliefs of the leaders being progressive and, you know, innovative. Uh, so also the personal beliefs of the managers about being appreciative leaders. They want to be appreciative leaders, considerate leaders. And safety too gives them this chance. As I said before, safety too uh, encourages leaders to give autonomy uh, to the workers, to give uh, workers you know, freedom to do work the way they want. And this really goes in line with many of the leadership theories that has been in the market in the last 20, 30 years, uh, you know, the, the appreciative leadership and the influencing leadership. So these two personal beliefs actually help the, the leaders accept the ideas of safety too, because they themselves believe that safety too is a progressive and appreciative theory. So as I said, being progressive is uh, being progressive is a trait valued by the, poor, poor, the postmodern society. It's a good thing. We need to do we need to do new things. We need to do innovative. We need to be innovative. So why not? So this really helped adopt the, the, uh, the, the theory. Also education and training leadership that the managers receive stresses the appreciative leadership and the importance of appreciative leadership. Uh, another thing also is the professional beliefs. As I said, there has been a lot of talks about safety two and about the weaknesses of safety one. And these talks and, and these conversations in the industry level and the professional level has influenced the thinking of the leaders. They start to see safety, safety one is very bad. We need to do something about it because of the, a lot of, uh, you know, all the news that are hearing about safety one and all the research they are reading about the weaknesses of safety one, they wanted to do something different. And uh, opposite, they are receiving uh, very positive information, uh, very, very positive, you know, arguments about safety two. So the professional beliefs about safety one and safety two actually helped the managers really accept, you know, the, the idea of safety two, adopting safety two. So as I said, safety one looked at as very negative, uh, and this happened through professional networking and because of the literature, all these venues helped, you know, reinforce these ideas about safety one and safety two and see the discrepancy between uh, both of them. I will give you an example of some of the statements given by the executive manager and the HR manager of these comp the company that I'm working with. And it will give you an idea about how, you know, this, their own ideologies of being progressive help them really understand safety too and accept and like safety too and accommodate, that, accommodate it in their companies. Uh, for example, the executive manager says the driving force behind adoption of safety too really goes back to our values and people being progressive. So you can see how he is referring to progressiveness as the reason why they like safety too, because it's an innovative theory. Uh, the HR manager is saying it's part of our organization values about being progressive and trying to do things differently. So this is very attractive idea of being different and innovative in the market. I think if that was to change, I would have to be like, do I really want to work here? We are gonna go back to this old way of compliance, having a compliance mindset. You see how negatively she is speaking about, you know, compliance and the safety one. So yeah, progressive is good. Cultural value safety too is progressive. So it's a rising assumption in the OHS field. And here also progressive means different and being different is a very good thing. So both are very uh, cultural values that help, you know, the managers or leadership likes the safety two ideas. You can see here also how negatively the assumption that mainstream safety is about compliance and compliance mindset is not the best thing. So now talking about the challenges, as I said, uh, it has been really uh, a tough journey for the company to implement safety too. It's not easy. It has never been an easy one. And it continues to be a very, pro I mean, uh, continues to be a challenge to the company and to the leadership. Two main challenges, the legal liability and institutionalized norms about bureaucracy and organization and professionals. Why do you think there is a problem in terms of legal liability? Can, can somebody just help me with this? Why do you think there will be problems in terms of the legal consequences of implementing safety too? 
maybe related to the ESA compliance? Yes, I mean, look at we can look together at it. For example, uh, there are some forces. For example, there is uh, there is a, an, a rule in the health and safety law says that every company has to do what is reasonably practicable, as far as reasonably practicable. Can, do you know this? I mean, are you familiar with this term? Doing what is yes. reasonably practicable? Reasonably yes, practicable uh, means what? Reasonably practicable means doing the best practice that is common in the industry. So if you go to the court and you have an accident and you go to the court and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the judge asks you what kind of practices you have been using, and if you said that I'm using a practice that is not common in the, in the industry, you are in trouble. Because it means that you are not doing reason what is reasonably practical. And this is goes you know, op opposite to what safety two is about. Safety two is about going off standard, going to innovate things that is not necessarily uh, in agreement with the uh, best, best practices in the, in the industry. So this is what's really the company is a very awkward position. Uh, they need to compromise this reasonably practicable defense if they want to apply or implement a practice that is not really common in the industry or in the field. So this is dangerous for them. Uh, also, you want to get rid of the job safety analysis and all this documentation of safety. Now, there is a problem because in the legal system, providing proof and documented record is very valuable, it's very important. So the legal system values records and evidence. If you want to remove documents from the site, safety documents, then how are you going to prove uh, um, to demonstrate due diligence and demonstrate that you have taken the right, you know, the right thing? Because the judge doesn't, the judge wants to see documents. And also the uh, OHS, Health and Safety, Bureau Veritas and SGS, all these, you know, certifying companies want to see also documents and proofs and evidences. So if you are getting, if you're going to get rid of all these documents, how are you going to demonstrate? So this is a challenge for safety too. So I will give you also to give you an idea about how difficult that is, how really scary that is. This is the executive manager talking about his emotions, what he feels about getting rid of, uh, you know, job safety analysis. He says, I absolutely believe that it doesn't add value. So look here, he believes that it has you no, know, there is an instrumental rationality in removing uh, paperwork. There's no problem. He, he's, he agrees that it doesn't add any value. He, he does not object that. But the fear of being held accountable, the fear of being held accountable for removing something and get us sent to jail, this fear is great. I don't know whether I have the courage to change that. So you can see how fearful, how scary that in his, uh, in his, so this is, a, so, so, I mean, Removing something is not good. Adding things is good, but removing things are really bad, especially for safety. It doesn't go, it doesn't go well with people. Removing a safety practice, removing a safety measure, oh, this is big, okay? So yeah, you see how the force of the, of the, of the emotions about going to jail and, the, and being scared. Uh, also the emotions plays a big role in that. So he hasn't taken the decision. This is the, this is the, the last thing, this is the finding. This is the last thing until now, for two years now, they are unable to take the decision of removing of job safety analysis. They are, they are maneuvering around, but they haven't taken like officially uh, a decision to get rid of the job safety analysis, although job safety analysis is not required by the law. So having a job safety analysis before the task, I'm mean like uh, P-task, like the field level, field level job safety analysis is not required by the, Queens, by the safety law here. But because it's a very common practice in the field, they are really, it's really fearful. It's, fear, it's really scary to be like an outliner, to be different from the, from the rest of the industry, especially if something wrong happens, somebody dies or something. And uh, the judge asks me about, uh, are you really reasonably practicable? Have you done every reasonable practicable? Uh, what about the best practice in the industry? Have you looked at that or not? So there's also another, so we talk about the legal requirement and how this legal requirements pushes back. There's other pushbacks also from the corporate, corporate logics. I mean, the way the organizations are, the business model that every organization now, not only in Australia, but around the world, the wage-based or the employment-based you know, business, this model of business, really the logics that underpin this logic pushes back against the ideas of safety too. So for example, safety two practices asks people or ask us to make people, to give people more authority to plan and to share the 
responsibility of you know putting plans and putting designs. But in the in the in the, in the other hand, what are the administrative organization that the management you know rules? The management holds the full authority to rule and direct because of hierarchy necessities and legal due diligence accountability. This is one of the very fixed you know ideologies of management. If management is not the ultimate authority to control and put directions, who else? So this one really contradicts the, uh, the, the very basic imperatives of management and organization administration rationality. Also safety too asks us to give autonomy and never blame the workers, never discipline the workers. But at the same time, the management you know, uh, beliefs, the management rules tells us that we need to have control and monitoring how we are going to do that. Are we going to leave people free doing what they want? This is, goes really contradicting with the, 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 norm, the norm of the management and the norm of the leadership. So also safety too is asking us to invest and put money and effort on observing normal work, work that is not necessarily like problematic, but we have a problem of limited resources. Are we going to spend our resources in observing normal work that does not impose any threats or are we going to focus on the problems? I think problems are, should be put in the, like the priority for the, for the management. So management actually naturally will look at the problems first to solve, not going to the normal work and the successes to study more. So this is another problematic uh, you know, pushback. So what I want to say here is that, sorry, what I want to say here is that, you know, being, uh, it's not enough only for a practice or for an idea to be instrumentally rational for us to, to be able to implement it, to adopt it. So, uh, So as I said, despite the fact that the management have seen very, I mean, instrumental rationality and in, in removing the paperwork, we couldn't remove the, the paperwork because there is other forces in the environment, in the institution environment that pushes us back from really getting rid of all these uh, practices. So it's not only that, it's because there has been this uh, conception that if we can prove that the practice uh, can reduce risk, then it will be implemented immediately, no. Not necessarily, even if it's really efficient, even if it reduces the risk, we still have to comply with the institutional forces, with the regulatory forces. We still have to be able to, uh, to agree with the organizational uh, you know, ideologies. So also one of the things, what may go wrong? Uh, what may go wrong? One of the things that I found in my observation, there is a risk of falling in the same traps of the traditional safety. So there is a risk that safety to implementation may lead to, again, focusing on the sharp end intervention. When safety to authors say people are the solution, they are, say, they are saying people, they are meaning the workers. Workers are the solution. To, what about the managers? So the, the theory really uh, kept silent about the managers. The, all the time they're talking about workers, they are the solution. They have to be, uh, you know, the experts that we need to go back to. They, we need to uh, train them to be resilient. What about the management themselves? Do we need to learn, teach workers to be able to uh, adapt with problems? Why don't we solve the problem in the first place rather than uh, helping them to adapt to the problems? So this is one of the things that I um, really found that there's a big risk that safety, uh, safety to implementation will, will again fall the same trap of uh, safety one. Also asking wrong questions. I mean, the company that I'm working with is focusing a lot on trying to prove I mean, trying to um, win the trust of the workers. They want the workers to trust the management, okay? But they forget that they need also to make the, man the workers trust, uh, they, they need also to trust the workers. So there is a problem now still with the leaders to really fully trust the workers and trust the workers' choices. Uh, and without that, there will be no genuine safety to implementation. Uh, it has to be both ways. You want to make the workers trust you, but you have also to trust the workers' choices. And you have to sit with yourself and question if you are really willing to do that or not. And also uh, reduced of decluttering of a document. Ah, now, most of the talk now about safety too is we want to get rid of the job safety analysis. So there is also a risk of focusing on one specific and removing this form or that form. This is not everything that safety too is about. Okay, we can remove a form, but this is not everything. There's a lot of other things that we need to concentrate about. 
Unfortunately, the company that I'm working with, I observe that they have now all the focus is on removing this food uh, and also losing sight of doing other things. So the takeaways that I want you to, uh, to take out of this is expect no novel safety practices in safety too, but you need to radically different, you have to have different mentality and conception about work and authority. Safety too, genuine implementation of safety too is about the extent, the extent the leadership is willing to change their perceptions about people, about work. The extent they are willing to give workers authority to share the decision-making with them. So genuine safety to implementation is really conditioned by this. If the management is still unwilling to do that, then we will end up having the same trends that we, we kept having from, uh, from, this, from the previous safety management systems. Not, it's not an easy journey, as I said. Transforming into safety tool challenges a wide range of institutionalized societal and cultural and professional beliefs. And safety tool, unfortunately, hasn't really tackled this problem. They never talk about how a management, how an organization can really handle all these forces coming out from the outside organization, the legal and the, uh, no, uh, the, cultural, the cultural forces. Also, safety and its practice are greatly linked to social environment. This is very important. In safety, and this is what I'm trying to as a, as a future research, I want, I would love to see uh, uh, my colleagues as a safety researchers to put some attention to uh, the environment. We need to go out of the company. We, we, we need to study how the safety beliefs and assumptions are generated and formed outside the organization. How the educational system uh, reinforces specific ideas of safety, how the legal system reinforces specific ideas of safety and so on. how our professional you know, gatherings and conferences really affect. If we don't do that, we are really wasting a very important, valuable uh, aspect of understanding safety. We need to go out of the organization and study the environment. So yeah, this is it. Thank you very much for your, uh, I'm not sure if I already passed the, the limit, but uh, I apologize if, if that happened. So you still have one more minute. Okay, so would you like to, uh, to for me to run the video for like 10 minutes or so? 10 minutes? Uh, I think we will run out of time if 10 okay, minutes. Okay, no problem. I will send it to you to later. Maybe you can uh, you can watch. I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe we will start the, with the question. And if we still have time, maybe you can run the video. How about okay. that? No problem. No problem. Okay. Okay, thank you for your presentation. This is a, a great insight for us, I think. Now uh, we move to the question uh, and answer session. We have uh, three persons or three participants. I would like to invite uh, first Miss um, Ida Ayu. Miss Ida Ayu, can you hear me, Miss Ida Ayu? Miss Ida Ayu, is there? Yeah. Yeah. Miss Ida Ayu, yeah, you have opportunity to ask your question directly to Mr. Hossam Abdul Saad. Please to have your time. Thank you, Mr. Uh, not sharing about safety two perspective. That I know that safety two is about understanding how the system is really work, how the performance and how to the anticipate and respond of proactive to development. Uh, but uh, is that mean that we need to stop looking what is goes wrong if uh, there are uh, any accident maybe? Thank you. Yeah, uh, okay, that's a very good question. Uh, actually not. And uh, if you look at any of the research about safety too, and if you, if you listen to the safety two authors, uh, no one will say we need to get rid of the uh, the traditional like metrics of safety and looking at the lagging indicators and stuff like that. They actually uh, they say we need to have like a hybrid system, a blend of both safety two and safety one because safety one still solves a lot of problems. Uh, we still need them, uh, but we need to consider also looking at the other direction of safety two as well. So they are suggesting a hybrid model uh, rather than really getting rid of safety one. So yeah, this is a good question. And um, no, the, nobody's asking to get rid of, actually we cannot, we won't be able to, as I said, you can see the, the, the very uh, powerful forces coming from the 
environment that will prevent any organization, you know, compromising the traditional, you know, traditional uh, practices. So what we are trying to do, that what the companies would want to do, I think, in the future, is to be smart in trying to maneuver around the uh, compliance-based practices. Uh, as I said, uh, we need to change only the mentality, the outcome, the objectives, but we will keep the same practices as they are. Uh, we will not get rid of uh, looking at the, at the numbers of accidents. They are there all the time. So, uh, but we will also, uh, we'll try to, safety tool is trying to undermine this. The safety tool authors are, they are always arguing that uh, we, in looking at the numbers of accidents, um, will hinder our uh, our efforts to improve safety but uh, but yeah answering the, your question no we there is no suggestion in the theory or uh, based on the safety authors safety two authors that we need to get rid of the old system okay but, but this is really problematic as well i mean this is will add cluttering so safety two wants to reduce the clut the reduced cluttering if you want to run the both systems together you will add more cluttering to the system, not less. And this is one of the findings that I found in my research, that safety two, implementation of safety two, besides safety one, will add cluttering. It will not reduce cluttering. Okay, I think that's a good answer. Yes. So, uh, Ms. Ida Ayu, thank you for your question, Ms. Ida Ayu. Now we move to the next participant, and there is uh, Mr. Stefan. Mr. Stefan, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Question in the Q and A column, but yeah, uh, please uh, take your time to ask directly to Mr. Hassan Abdul Sat for your question, Mr. Yeah. Stefan. Yeah, thank you. Assalamualaikum, Mr. Hassan. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, new practical knowledge for me. Yeah, but you said that in, in safety two, in the field of practice, safety officer let the workers do their works even though it is not meet the HSE standards, unless it is critical condition to stop the activities immediately. Yes. Is it right? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah. This is, I just heard this kind of approach from you and not quite common in Indonesia, in my opinion. My yeah, question is, is yeah, okay. <laughs> it's, it's <one> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but my, my question is, how do you measure the critical risk or when do you decide it? Uh, it is critical or not for the workers due to the risk perception of each person, even among the safety officers, might might be the condition um, might be see the condition differently. Thank you. Yeah, I okay, I agree with you. It, I mean, risk is a subjective thing, but I think high high risk activities and high risk behaviors. Uh, there is some kind of agreements among the safety. I mean, working at height, for example, without the handrail is a very imminent risk. So I don't think uh, anybody would argue that this is not a high risk. Uh, so usually, as I said, it's, it, it refers to the, the judgment of the safety officer. And I don't think that um, high risk activities can be really seen and noticed from the first side. So it's not really, a problem, it's not a big problem uh, to differentiate between high risk and low risk, uh, especially with a knowledgeable and experienced safety officer. Yeah. And as I said, it's, as, and that's why I'm telling you, it's uh, it's not an easy one. Uh, safety to implementation has a lot of challenges. And uh, the fact that you are going uh, to the site, leaving workers do what they want is really a big responsibility. And especially in the legal terms. So um, yeah, uh, but as I said, this is the, the price that the company has to pay. I mean, if you want really to generally change the perceptions about work and, and people, you need to acknowledge the fact that what people really decides to do is not really crazy all the time. Uh, they have a point and you have to help them because if you give them, I mean, instead of, the, the idea of that is we don't want to push people to hide. We don't want to push people to go underground with their uh, you know, violations. We want them to show it to us so that we can take measures. So if, if, if there's any activity, any adaptation that we think is really like risky, we can at least suspend it without discipline and then discuss it later on with, uh, with the people concerned. Uh, but you know, stopping that and punishing and disciplining for the first sight, no, this is, this is not what safety tool is, is about. And it's really a warning us not to do that because we don't want people to uh, run away from us. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you, 
thank you Mr. Stefan for your question and also Mr. Hossam Abdul Sat for your answer. I think mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's our challenge right in the safety. Okay, maybe I will uh, move next to the participant. I will invite uh, Mr. Rahmat Darmawan. Is there? Can you hear hear me, Mr. Rahmat Darmawan? Mr. Rahmat Darmawan, are you there? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Mr. Rahmat Darmawan. Uh, yeah. yeah. Is this the door event or Asr event? We have Asr event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mr. Rahmat Darmawan. Uh, yeah, you have opportunity. You have time to ask uh, your question directly to uh, Mr. Hassan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to ask uh, if an organization want to implement 62, uh, does the organization need to achieve a particular level of safety culture maturity prior to safety to adaptation? Because I'm afraid that there is a risk of giving more autonomy to organization with a low level of safety culture or uh, yeah, with, without uh, proper knowledge or competence. Yeah, absolutely, yes. I mean, as I said, if it's a, if, if it's a genuine implementation, yes, there is no way a uh, low maturity co company can really take this challenge. But if it's just a superficial, like what happens all the time with safety initiatives, then any company can can claim to have safety too. So um, it's, uh, yeah, I agree with you absolutely. Uh, this kind of genuine implementation of safety too, with all these challenges needs uh, a leadership that is really willing to go and risk everything they know about safety and everything, all the perceptions, all the cultural perceptions about safety and work. So, and it's not easy, it's not for everyone yet. But as I said, I suspect that in the future as this model, you know, become a trend and then the, like a fashion in the industry, companies even with low maturity will start to uh, superficially uh, implement it like uh, from the surface only, not really genuinely in implementation. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you uh, for your question, uh, Mr. Rahmat Darwan. Uh, I would like to comment about this uh, safety uh, culture related to the safety too, uh, Mr. Hassan. Yes. So, uh, in your opinion, when safety to become trained in the future, this we uh, really need, uh, I mean, does the safety culture maturity assessment or measurement still uh, need to be assessed in the organization. What do you think? Look, the, the, you know, safety culture is a is a is a critical concept. This, this is something there called safety culture. I agree with that. But the problem is that the way you are measuring safety culture is not really an effective. So safety culture cannot really uh, assist or gauged or measured through like surveys or questionnaires and stuff like that or or checklists or inspections. I mean, safety culture, I think what the best thing about safety too, in my opinion, which the thing that I really like, and I think this is really promising safety too, is the idea that safety too now starting to tell safety people to research the, the, their organization, to make research, to observe work and study the work. And this is how we can understand like qualitative research. So I think in the future, safety professionals need to be a qualitative researcher. Uh, I've told you about the safety officer that goes on site to uh, document what the workers do. He does the same job that I do with the company. He goes to the site, he hears what the workers so say and do, and he document that and he goes back to the office and they analyze what they saw and what they hear. So they are doing qualitative research. Uh, and that's, this is how I think we can uh, assess or measure safety culture. Uh, but and with the current regime, the current way of measuring safety pressure, I mean, going, I mean, you know, keeping our uh, going on with the, with, the, with, the, with the existing models of maturity of culture with the same methods of measurement, it will not really give us any, any, any new value, any value, because this is one of the, as I said, it has been there all the time. It didn't really improve safety. Uh, measurement of, of safety culture become uh, self-assurance, like something that I, that I, to make me comfortable that I'm doing something. Uh, it has been now used as a way to demonstrate that we as a company are doing something. I know that there is a big pressure on organizations to get rid of lagging indicators. 
So people are really now busy with trying to put as much as safety uh, you know, activities in place so that they can demonstrate and, and prove that they are doing something. The more safety activities you have, the better or the keenest or the more serious you are in the front of the regulator or in front of the society or, and even in front of the workers themselves. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, cultural assessments these days are the ones that are being used now does not help any purpose, but giving the company a false impression that they are okay, people are happy, and uh, also demonstrating to the outside that we are doing something about safety. But I think if we want really to study culture, we want to be qualitative researcher as safety officers and start to study the, the doings and sayings of the workers and the relationships and the interactions of the management with the workers. And, and yeah, so this is how I see it actually. And I think I like safety too in that. It encouraged the safety department to start to be like researchers. Yeah. Okay. Again, I think I get your point here. Yeah. But uh, yeah. But it's really yeah, it's a good question. Thank you for that question. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, we uh, run off of time, uh, but I will invite uh, the last participant to uh, have a question. Uh, maybe I will invite uh, Mr. Bagus Saleh. Mr. Bagus Ale, can you open your mic? Yeah. Mr. Bagus Ale, are you ready to ask your question directly? Yes, Pak Mufti. Thank you. Okay. Take your time, Pak Bagus. Yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Pak Hussam. My name is Bagus. Nice to meet you. I'm very well, thank you. And how are you? Good, good. Thanks. Okay, I'm working in a in a oil company, national national oil company that interested in the uh, subject of safety too. Really? I would like to know what is the identif identifiable factors of a company that already subscribed to the safety too. I mean, how to recognize this company? which are already already implemented uh, safety too. Was it because by their policy, vision, mission, management statement, programs, or even when we look at or mingle with the workers, how can we know that their company already subscribed to safety too? Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Thank you Bagus. It's the same same answer that I gave to uh, to Mufti about the culture. Uh, there is no way you can know that the company is implementing any safety uh, you know idea or any safety you know program until you go and live a little bit in that organization to see exactly with your hand with your eyes what's going on. You have to spend some time, and that's why I think the work of auditors coming for the site for a couple of days and then leaving is not really any effective because they cannot see the whole the everything. They won't be able to see everything, but to to say that this company is really implementing this safety program or that, you have to live, you have to stay, you have to uh, spend some time in the organization, uh, observing how work is done, how management is dealing with the workers, and what the workers think about the management, what kind of jokes the workers doing about the management, what kind of frustrations, uh, what 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 are the workers are angry about. So you want, you need to hear that. Uh, not as a as a as an interviewer, but as an observer. Nobody really like uh, realizing that you are in place. So this is the only way that you know if if a company has really subscribed to uh, to this program. And as I said, um, like any other safety program, uh, every company will have the choice either to put to to have this program as superficially implemented, or to to be generally implemented. And also implementation is not. Zero one is not one off. It has levels. So like any other system, you have different levels. So the company that I'm working with, uh, they they haven't really uh, accomplished every objective they wanted. They have a lot of frustrations. Although the leadership is really a, a big believer in safety too, and they do genuine efforts to uh, to to make this uh, implementation or happen or successful, but they struggle, and uh, they never said that we have accomplished safety too. They never say that. They say that it's a journey. We are in a journey. It's a work in progress. And as long as there is a, a leadership that is, the, the subject is, 
is, is continuous, become a, con a continuous discussion, a continuous conversation within the organization, then they think it's okay. So they don't want to, they don't want to stop talking about safety do they don't want to stop all the the, the practices they're trying to do even though these practices some of them does not really qualify to fulfill the theory but they are still they hope that in the future changes in the regulatory system uh, you know as the safety to uh, um, safety to the theory becomes more trendy in the in the industry maybe they will be able to to be to implement more or to or to, to be to be courageous to be more courageous to implement uh, like deeper into the into the into the plan into the, the the system okay um hope hopefully i hope that answers the question but uh, yeah i, I and then just to summarize it you cannot know you have to go and stay to 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 spend some time with the organization to know if they they really uh, really about safety too they could say that in their uh, uh, in their vision on their policy but uh, if you want to see what level do they really implementing this, you have to spend some time. Yeah, it's like like when you thank you very much. Recognize welcome, people. Welcome. Yeah, it's like maybe uh, it's like when you want to know a people, you have to go deep. Yeah, it's not as absolutely, just absolutely, yes. You or uh, thing like that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We get your 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 point. Okay, maybe uh, uh, the last the last question, or maybe comment from me. You mentioned about the uh, cross skill program in your slide, uh, about, uh, resilience. Yeah, uh, can you elaborate or maybe explain uh, what kind of cross skill program did you mention? Ah, the, the company. Yeah, yeah, they are. That's a good question. Sorry, I didn't talk about that. Maybe it was because of the time. What they did is that they they made a program. Like take a, a worker from the maintenance uh, maintenance uh, department to do work in the installation department, and take the people doing installation to do work in the maintenance department, so that they each one of them learn the skills of the of the other departments. Mm -hmm. So they train workers to gain other skills from other departments. So the maintenance go to installation, installations goes to I don't know uh, maintenance and stuff like that. So they are just like rotating workers uh, on the different departments so that they gain experience and skills from different departments. So they're trying to enhance their skills and ability to be able to adapt with any you know, problems or any contingent you know, emergency or anything. Okay. Yeah, so this is the, <laughs> that was the program about it. But it's difficult as well. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of challenges there because you know, if, you, if you take somebody who has been all the time doing very, a specific job in the maintenance and and taking him to do installation he will spend a lot of time until he is really like skillful to do that job so yeah. you have to compromise efficiency because you're gonna stay uh, you he's gonna spend more and more time doing the job if compared to somebody who is like, experienced so they are they were really complaining about that and this specific program although they uh, they took some steps but it was also uh, there was a lot of challenges about it so it wasn't easy Okay, yeah. so this is the bigger thing to enhance the skill, or maybe to uh, maybe different, different, the, different experiences from different departments. Different mention. Yes. Okay, that's that's interesting. Okay, uh, maybe we uh, are in the end of our program. Uh, I don't know. We still have time, Miss Miranda. Or... Uh, I, I would prefer to send it to you because I have a lot of time now. Oh, okay. uh, and then, but yeah, uh, I will I will leave that. I will send you the. Uh, you have the link already and the and slides. The okay. slides already. So uh, I, I I hope that you will spread it to the, the audience. They uh, it's it's very uh, informative yes. about safety too. But it's a, it's a marketing one. So <laughs> it's, it's very very marketing. Like it's a, like it's, it's like an advertisement about safety too, more than yeah. anything. Okay. But there's a good information there. Yes. Okay, we will. Okay. So uh, maybe let me conclude uh, a little bit about what uh, we have in this uh, afternoon in Indonesia, Indonesian time. So uh, safety to uh, what uh, Mr. Hossam uh, Abdul Saad mentioned is uh, it's an idea. Yeah. That's that's the key point. I think it's an idea, not just a theory. Yeah, you mentioned it's an idea. So it's bigger than just a theory, it's an idea. And then uh, 
there is no novel in practice, but uh, this is about the mindset maybe, yeah. We change the mindset, the paradigm about safety in our uh, daily uh, uh, day-to-day -day activities in the organization. And then uh, I think uh, the other key point is about the uh, adaptation, yeah, adaptation uh, to the to the new paradigm, new perspective, uh, which is uh, this a uh, lot of challenge, yeah, and not only in Australia, but I think it's uh, worldwide, yeah, in in, in safety. Yeah. So uh, from from the point, uh, our challenge is to maybe as a, in academic point of view. We have to do a lot of qualitative research. Yeah, you mentioned. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's that, 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 that the interesting uh, point, I think. Uh, so we can see uh, deeper, more deeper. Yeah, about yeah, the. We want to look phenomenon. also outside the organization. We want to look at the yeah. environment, the institutional environment. Yeah. Yeah, I think that will be a, a good topic for uh, researchers. Yeah. Yeah, next topic for research. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Hossam Abdul Saad, MSc, PhD, a candidate. The, this is very interesting for us, uh, for our students, and also us for uh, the faculty uh, in Occupational Health and Safety Department uh, program in University of Indonesia. Uh, I, I think we get a lot of insight from you. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, I hope we, I have... we, we can continue to. Uh, collaboration or something absolutely, like that. Yeah. It will be yeah. my pleasure. Really. Yeah, especially in the safety to field. Yeah. Yes, please, yeah. Okay, so I uh, will uh, close this session and uh, give back to our uh, apa, uh, Master of Ceremony, Ms. Miranda Sutia. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Miranda. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mufti and Mr. Hossam. Thank you, Mufti. Yeah, this is the end of the presentation and discussion session today. Uh, so we would like to thank our speaker of the day, Mr. Hossam Abdul Saad, and also our moderator, Mr. Mufti Wirawan, as well as all parties that contributed to today's event. And we also thank you for your participation in this online short course. And we apologize if there's any inconvenience in today's event. And also as a reminder, all participants are expected to fill in the attendance list on the link that we have sent to you on the chat column. And also the e-certificate will be sent to each participant in accordance with the data during the registration. And also we would like to invite you to join our next international guest lecture on Wednesday, 28th of April. The topic is uh, PFAS and fluoride free fire fragments, performance versus environmental and health with speaker from Charles Darwin University, Professor Bogdan Blugogorski, and also moderated by Professor Dr. Fatma Lestari, MSc, PhD. So we would like to have you all in this international guest lecture. And before I close, I would like to invite our panelists to take picture together. So our panelists, please activate your video so we can take picture together. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, once more. Three, two, one. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. So this concluded today's event. Uh, so I will close. Thank you very much. Wabillahi taufiq wahidaya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. See you again. Thank you very much. See you again. Uh, Ijin Lid. Makasih Miranda Adi. Makasih. Makasih. Terima kasih. 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 Terima k